And we are live. Okay, let me let everyone in. Hello to those joining us. Welcome. I'll just wait till I can see your yes. Three. Now I'm going to keep an eye on the side um, just as um, more guests arrive, um, but I will, as it's 5.30, um, just get started with a, um, a welcome. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this very special um, launch. We we're just discussing uh, whether this can be a launch, and I think it definitely can, um, an online launch and a panel discussion um, for our Inside Voices reflections on COVID-19. My name is Bianca Milroy. I'm a writer and a proud member of the Avid Reader community. It is my pleasure to be your host tonight, this afternoon. I'll officially start the event uh, with an acknowledgement of country, and I'd like you to join me from wherever you may be. When we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, we pay respect to those past, present and emerging. We acknowledge this land was never ceded and has always been a place of creativity and community and of rich story, storytelling tradition. From where I call home, Mianjin or Brisbane, I pay respect to the Yagara and Turrbal people. Just admitting two more. Okay. Right. So before we get started with introducing our guests for this evening, um, and I'll just mention a few housekeeping items. Firstly, if you haven't attended an online event with Avid Reader before, please note that all attendees are placed on mute for the conversation and for the Q&A section. Uh, however, at the end, I'll allow everyone to unmute themselves so we can join together in thanking our special guest speakers. For the tech side of things, because everyone's computer or device will have different settings, we unfortunately can't offer technical support during the event. Uh, if you do have settings to speaker view, um, which is your main screen, the two guest speakers will take up the screen space. To, everyone, to see everyone's beautiful faces, simply switch over to gallery view. There is a chat function built into Zoom that you can use to communicate directly with me, your host. Uh, one important thing I'll pass on shortly in that chat, so you'll see a little um, notification, click on that and that will lead you to the chat on the side. Um, what I'll be passing on is a link to where you can purchase your copy of our Inside Voices. Um, and also for the next 24 hours, you can use the code event which is E-V-E-N-T, uh, and receive 10% off any books you order online with Avid Reader. Just see a few more there. So I'm just meeting more people. Hello and welcome to everyone who's just joining us now. Okay. Uh, so when this evening speakers call for audience questions, um, this is where you should type them in so that I can read them out aloud. Um, please feel free to send through your questions at any time um, during the event. We can't promise to get to everyone's, but we will certainly do our best. Now, without more ado, I'd like to now introduce our moderator and special uh, guest tonight, um, Steve Kaplan. Uh, Steve Kaplan has written for theatre, published short stories and was a founding member of the West End based street arts community theatre company. Mm -hmm. He is a local historian and an author who is currently completing a novel based on his wildly adventurous Italian ancestors who arrived in Australia via New Guinea as refugees in 1881. Amazingly, we've just had a little chat and we actually, um, I have some Italian relatives that arrived on that same voyage. So it's just incredible the connections that can come through um, the story community. Uh, so Steve lives and writes in Brisbane and I'll now hand over to you, Steve, to introduce our panel. Okay. Thank you, Bianca. Welcome, everybody. Um, what a year it's been, crazy year. And um, Matthew and his team, who you'll meet in a minute, have um, <laughs> exhibited fantastic timing in getting their book together. As you, I hope you recognise this already. It's, as Bianca said, our Inside Voices. So it's a collection of about 50 stories in, written by Brisbane, mainly Brisbane writers in response to their COVID experience. 
So um, in the next hour, we will um, hear from Matthew, who was the commissioning editor of the book, from uh, Edwina Shaw, who was one of the editors of the book, and Andrea Baldwin, who was one of the um, contributors to the book. And we're going to have a little conversation about um, the background to how this book came about and how you put an anthology like this together. But also we'll hear some reading so you get an idea of what's in the book. It's a great collection. I highly recommend it. I don't usually read anthologies from one from beginning to end, but I did with this one. Um, there was something very personal about um, these accounts. So um, I'm going to start with Matthew. And um, Matthew's a Brisbane writer, historian. He's got a fascination with medical history. Um, he's also a fiction writer but he's mostly in the last few years been concentrating on his um, interest in local history and medical history. So Matthew, um, let's start, if we could, if you could uh, give us a reading from one of the, your favourite pieces from the book, and then we'll talk about how the commissioning process um, unfolded. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, I hope I'm there because a few minutes ago, my iPad decided to throw me out, but I'm, I hope I'm reconnected now. I'm going to read a little bit of a story for, called Button and Bobby, written by Tony Risson. And Tony is usually a historian. Uh, she's done a history of Greek cafes in Queensland at the State Library a couple of years ago. And she's also a historian of lollies. And she's written a very imaginative story about a dog. And I chose it because it's such a distinctive and creative story. And the book is mostly a creative anthology. Uh, it's not so much medical statistics and um, health advice. It's, it's, it's a book of creative writing. And so I chose this because it's such a creative story. How about a walk? We had wandered the streets every day together in the beginning, but not now, not for years. If we were thickening round the middle, we knew the delight of dozing in the sun and enjoyed the rewards that came with maturity. Lately, we spent most days cuddled up on the couch, eating Cheerios dipped in tomato sauce and watching something he called Netflix. Come on, boy. He'd been there from the beginning. He was my life. She had come much later. With a soft word and a biscuit and a scratch behind the ears, she was the love of my life. They stayed home with me most days now, just the three of us, day in, day out. But they were seldom together except for the evening meal, and sometimes not even then. The tension between them made the air crackle. But um, I leapt to my feet. She wasn't coming with us. He didn't even ask. A quick detour through the kitchen to sniff her toes and then I paddled after him, leaving her to chew on the angry words that had passed between them and roast the lamb shoulder she'd pulled from the freezer. The door banged behind us. Before I reached the bottom step, I heard it. The silence. Not a single car in our street. No traffic coming along Annerley Road. No skateboard shuddering over joins in the concrete as the teenager from up the street swooped by. People exercised in their backyards. I'd seen them from our side window. But he explained as he clipped the leash onto my collar that people were allowed out to walk a dog. I yanked him through the front gate, my chest swelling with pride. I was his passport to the world beyond the fence. We gave other dog walkers a wide berth, smiled and said hello as we passed. I'd almost forgotten the, the scent, the street of the cat across the road, the smell of the timber fence baking in the sunshine, the hollow gaze of the old man who sits in his front curtains. A magpie landed on an overhead wire and I passed to bark at it. Then he tugged the leash and quickened the pace. By the time we reached the top of the street, I was panting and he was doubled over, clutching his side. Enough for today, eh, Button? He said between gasps. 
and we headed back down the slope. I raced to the kitchen to lick her hand. Relating our adventure the only way I knew how. Something special always waited in her hand. Today, there was a scrap of lamb fat tinged with the rosemary she'd crushed between her fingers. The walk was just as hard the next day and the day after that. But sometimes we stopped. That's the appropriate social distance to pass a few words. Dogs don't worry about social distancing. While he talked makeshift morgues and economic disaster, we wound through their legs and sniffed each other's genitals. By the end of the week, we were running to the top of the street. And the story goes on and Button is borrowed by neighbour after neighbour to give everyone an excuse to go out into the COVID world. It's a fantastic story. Yeah, lovely story, Matthew. And there's a lot of uh, incredible range of stories in the anthology. A lot of, a lot of uh, serious stories, but also some very funny ones, which um, makes the balance uh, beautiful. Mm. But Matthew, let's go back a little bit. Um, so COVID-19, 2020, but you were uh, doing something in 2018 and 19 um, where you had no idea that COVID-19 was going to, and a pandemic was going to hit the world. You were in, involved in local history um, through a Brisbane City Council grant. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Well, I knew the centenary anniversary of the Spanish flu pandemic was coming up on in 2019 when the Spanish flu got to Queensland. And the Brisbane City Council saw fit to give me a grant to study the history and write about the history of Brisbane during that epidemic. Um, that resulted in a book of, a history book called City and Masks, How Brisbane Fought the Spanish Flu. I thought it was gonna be a very morbid, sad story, but it was quite uplifting in the end because I found the story of the women who volunteered to help their friends and their, their neighbours, their communities, um, by very humble and heroic work, feeding the very sick people. Uh, hundreds of people died in Brisbane in that epidemic, um, but hundreds more would have died if it wasn't for these brave women who went house to house feeding people who were too sick to cook, too sick often to even to, to eat. And they needed food and they needed basic nursing and they needed human contact, comforting, to get through another day and to get through the epidemic. So that is the, the powerfully uplifting story of the Heart of City of Masks. Then there was another book, a um, book of short stories that were published earlier this year called All We Could Do, Queensland Flu Stories. And that has some very interesting stories. Um, short stories, 15 short stories by different writers. But they're more creative writing. This original book, City and Masks, was straight narrative history. And a great and a really good and important work, Matthew. Um, and that an, that other anthology of um, short stories is uh, a beauty too, because they're all true stories, uh, using creative fiction and historical fiction as their as their form. So that when when was that released? Um, that was released in uh, April. Um, I had worked to get it out earlier, but got too busy with other jobs, um, uh, you know, things kept popping up. And then the COVID made everyone really interested in Spanish flu. People who hadn't been previously interested in it were ringing me to ask me to do talks to the history groups and so on. So I thought people were going to want these stories now more than they did last year more than they will next year. So mm. I, I pushed it out. They are fantastic stories, especially yours, Steve. Your, your story in the book is extraordinary. 
Um, I don't think we've got time to talk about it today, but it, it is an extraordinary story. Um, yes, <laughs> it's remarkable, really, <laughs> the things that can happen in one's life. Um, tragic, comic, and uh, yeah, hopeful, and God, gains and losses all in one <laughs> all in one year. So Matthew, then suddenly COVID hits. Um, what, and then you thought, gee, I thought it was all, I thought those, uh, the Spanish flu was all over and now here we go again. So what was your thinking? What, what prompted you to um, put this one together and what did you have in mind? What prompted me with this was a phone call from my co-publisher, who's, which is a business called Paradigm Print Media. And Paradigm Print Media organised printing for all kinds of books, and, and things like uh, menus and uh, for restaurants and posters for real estate owners, all kinds of printing in Brisbane. And my colleague at Paradigm Print Media rang me and said, the industry is going to hell, it's falling off a cliff. We've talked before about doing a book together, let's do a book together now as a practical thing to create more work for my printing partners more work for my staff in, in layout design. And, and the book cover and the book layout was done by um, Michael and, at uh, Paradigm Print Media. And very nice job he did. So it was a practical thing, but it was also a creative thing because one of the things that I missed in the, um, in the Spanish flu research was stories, was narrative stories, creative stories, characters. Um, there was a lot of data, a lot of statistics, a lot of information, but I couldn't find any stories. Mm. So, and these, I mean, I, this collection, what, what I love about it is it's just so immediate. I mean, everyone, everyone has had a common experience. And yet what the book shows is that all of those experiences, while they've got um, COVID in common sort of were experienced in a, a, a large, a wide range of different ways. Mm. So, so you put a, so then you thought, well, let's get some of those personal stories. How do you get, um, well, you know, what is, how did you go about getting contributions and how many contributions were you offered? We, we began, or my first step was to get in touch with the Writers' Centre. Queensland Writers' Centre and asked for an ad to be put in the newsletter and some people certainly responded to that. That was fantastic to have. Um, re reached out to people who I had um, published in previous anthologies. Um, but I think the most important thing was having these, this team of editors, um, particularly Edwina um, Shaw, who's, who we're going to meet soon. Um, and Edwina knows a ton of writers and she put a call out and attracted in a lot of great writers and those writers know writers and Andrea knows a lot of writers. She, she put the call out with her, her um, colleagues. Um, so there was a lot of word of mouth. We ended up getting um, around 120 submissions, I think. Um, and like you said before, there's over 50 in the anthology. So we were able to include a lot. We had to ask some people to do some pretty severe cutting. We were aiming for short, punchy stuff and we were aiming for a lot of diversity. So we didn't want everything to be the same note. And I ended up with four great editors. Um, Carolyn Gardham, Edwina Shaw, Louise Martin Chu, and Nathan Shepherdson. Nathan Shepherdson. And these four worked very hard to go through the big pile and distill it down and to work with the writers to just improve them where they could be. Um, so we have some seriously good writers in there like Sam Wagon Watson, Amanda Niehaus, Jessica White, uh, Angelina Hurley, Nick Earls, um, Kate Hunter, 
Sarah Clanboard, um, too many to name. There's quite a few artists who wrote in the book. A few painters. Yeah, yeah uh, that was interesting. Sculptor. Mm. It's, it's, it's very interesting who felt compelled to do some creative writing about this. Yeah. Well, um, let's bring in, in Edwina here since we've um, mentioned her name and the next step after getting 120 or 130 submissions is what do you, what do, you do with them? How do you turn them into a book? So Edwina, um, now for those of you who don't know Edwina, she's a um, prolific writer. She's a teacher, creative writing and editor, as Matthew has said. Um, she's written dozens of, probably that's an underestimate of short stories. She's into screenwriting as well. And she edited Bajoki Blues back in 2019, which was another collaboration between Matthew and um, Edwina was the editor on that one. So um, Edwina has a very busy life, does a lot of teaching. So um, Edwina, what drew you to this project? Uh, well, Matthew asked me, and I'd worked with you. Matthew before on Bielke Blues, and I, I learned how much fun it is to do an anthology and how wonderful it is to get all those complimentary voices together. And it's a great opportunity for me to be able to, you know, give my writer friends a publication opportunity as well. But it was very interesting working as a group of editors. We had a very interesting meeting early on where we met outside the State Library Cafe and all stood quite far apart and <laughs> it was very empty and ghost townish and <laughs> really quite freaky. <laughs> but it was nice to meet everybody. And it was fantastic having that. I think Louise was responsible for getting a lot of those artists uh, involved and, and for me that's a real highlight of the book as well as having um, those other artists voices um, and Carolyn was the queen of the spreadsheet so we had so many stories and not being able to meet in person um, having Carolyn super organized mine with the spreadsheet and we would say okay a couple of lines about this one who likes this one and we'd each go through and put our yeses or no's or maybe's and then yes figure out which ones were all our definites and which ones were the maybes and you had to go in and fight for your maybes to get them in and then it was all about finding that balance between the kind of stories and yes put, making sure that we had enough lightness to balance the dark making sure we had a variety of voices it's a very important that we had the indigenous voice represented and people across all spectrums, different ages as well. And um, yeah, I was really happy because with Bielke Blues, hang on, I'm doing Paul Richard's trick, Bielke Blues, <laughs> uh, they were all non-fiction, uh, yeah, all memoir and essays except for my piece. So I was thrilled that this time we got some fiction and some really interesting fiction from not just people I knew, but uh, also new writers that I discovered like Karen Lee Thompson. I, I just loved her story. It was so out there, weird and quirky. Which one's that? That's Megan the Margarets. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Like, Auntie can't go to the shop because the COVIDs are there. It's like, oh, these COVIDs, they're a dangerous couple. Or maybe it's an army. So, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah. That's very funny, that one. Yeah. Um, so the, there's four of you plus Matthew trying to um, grapple your way through... Um, 120 submissions. Did you, was there a, I guess the theme um, sort of stated itself, you didn't need to look for a theme and you were looking for a balance. Were you worried that perhaps you, you and the team had got, were starting too early in the COVID thing? Because it strikes me that this, you got on the front foot early, perhaps COVID could have disappeared and resolved itself within the first three months of the year. It hasn't. And on the other hand, perhaps COVID was going to go on for years, so um, it could become a series. So was, was there any discussion about um, timing? Uh, well, we knew that it wanted, we wanted to get it done quickly. So it was all done very quickly between March and June. Uh, we collected those 120 stories, got them down to around, and, and, and poems, thank goodness for Patrick, 
doing the poems and then winnowing them down to the 50 and then editing those pieces so that they got smaller and smaller so we could fit them all in. Um, so we, we just knew that it wanted to come out in June. I mean, <laughs> we were hoping for perhaps a little more drama, <laughs> but uh, luckily we've been in Queensland and, you know, we're very, very protected. So, um, and, and have been very fortunate. So yes. that's so interesting you say that. Perhaps a, an, an anthology in Victoria might be quite different. Oh gosh, yes. Their, their experience of COVID is a completely different kettle of fish. I think mm. the second lockdown is sending everyone mad. Mm. Mm. Well, perhaps, you know, in the future, there might be a whole bookshelf of uh, COVID anthologies. You know, you look oh, at the I've United States been. and uh, <laughs> um, be fascinating to put them all together and sort of um, look, look for the differences. We see it every day on the TV. We're almost sick of it. But um, personal stories bring it to life in, in a much different way. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it sounds like that was pretty simple, really. Did, so were there no, um, no mash well, A lot of charts. <laughs> a lot of what? A lot of the tables, a lot of Carolyn's tables okay. and fussing and, and then, of course, getting the order as well. So once we had, um, oh, there you go. Come and then Benny Bananas got one working on a COVID-related anthology. Yeah, coming out of Melbourne. Okay. Great. Mm. Um, so there's, there's lots going on, but yeah. that's not the only one I've heard of either. But, um, yes, yeah, so finding the order was another sort of, yes, jigsaw puzzle. It's always a jigsaw puzzle, no matter what you're writing. The getting everything into the right order uh, is the trickiest bit, I think. Yeah, yeah. So can you talk about that just for a moment, about how you do think about order? For those who are listening, they might be interested in, I uh, hope we're not boring them with the machinations of putting an anthology together. We'll get you to read something in a moment. But yeah. Uh, so, um, well, the first thing is, of course, you want a really um, compelling and um, on-topic story that's going to draw people in. So we had Pat Hoffey's terrible... I mean, it's a mm. wonderfully written story, but her mm. experience of COVID was extreme mm. in that yeah. um, her daughter had been run over by a train in Paris and she ends up in lockdown in Paris, not being able to touch mm. or see her daughter. Uh, so mm. it was, yeah, that was a real full the dramatic reality of, of COVID. And then mm. finding then other voices to keep us going, making sure that we had... Um, important voices and uh, highlighted, uh, but also spread through the book. Mm, I really yeah. like the girl's poem as well. It's a beautiful poem. Okay. Uh, and so I we can urge, urge everyone to go and get their copy or buy a copy. And uh, well, there's many things in there that are worthy of um, attention, I reckon, from the yeah. serious to the whimsical. Now, have you, you've, well, one of the, speaking of whimsical, um, I got halfway through the book and, and came to your story, Edwina, and um, well, I laughed out loud. I thought, <laughs> this is wild. I read the first couple of pages and I thought, what's going on? Yeah. Um, but it flowed and it was beautiful and it was quite, um, well, it was charming really and, and funny. Would you like to read a bit of it for us? Yeah, I would. I, I, I'm very fond of this story too. Because um, that's based on a real life caller who did say these things to me. But then, of course, being a writer, I just let my imagination take me away. It was either going to end very badly or mm. I'm trying to write about happier things these days. So you'll have to find the book to find out what happens, but this is how it starts. So uh, the gentleman caller. Madam, I will call again and again and again. Mary knew she'd made a mistake ever picking up the telephone knew it even more when somehow the Indian voice on the end of the line had convinced her to open her computer so the kindly gentleman could help her get her files in order. He was calling from Microsoft, he said. She didn't know much about computers. She never used it, really. The children had bought it for her so they could Skype, but she'd never really figured it out. So she let the fellow go on and show her how to do things. However, the niggling feeling in her stomach wouldn't let her continue, especially after she'd already given him her name and address. And then he started asking about her bank account. 
She was sure she'd seen something about this kind of thing on a current affair. So she'd hung up. She thought she'd never hear from him again. She was wrong. He rang again the next day, demanding she let him finish the job they'd started on the computer. No, said Mary, glad she'd taken that course on assertiveness at the local library when it was still open. I've heard about these scams. I'm hanging up now and I'll re be reporting this to the police. She thought that would scare him off. Scammers. She shook her head in dismay. You'd think they'd give it a rest when the whole world was turned upside down with this COVID-19 disaster. She put the phone down, proud of her forthrightness, certain that Barry was looking down on her from the heavens, shaking his head at disbelief at how brave his wife had become over these last 10 years without him. She didn't ring the police though. She should have. At exactly the same time the following day, just after lunch, the phone rang again. Mary hesitated, but picked it up anyway. What if it was her son, Brian, calling from Singapore where he worked now? What if he wasn't well? Or maybe it was Miriam, her daughter, wanting Mary's shopping list. That seemed to be the only time she ever called these days. Mary didn't mind. It was good just to hear her voice, any voice. This staying at home business was becoming a trial. At least at the shops, she'd bumped into people and could have a chat. Good day to you, madam. The Indian man's tone was unmistakably sinister. Are you ready to finish what we started? Mary screamed into the receiver, no! On the current affairs program, they'd said you should blow a whistle down the line, but she didn't have one handy. Surely a scream would work just as well, make his ears ring. Mary screamed again, screamed and screamed and screamed, letting out all the rage and loss and loneliness she hadn't even known was there. She screamed loud and long until her throat was raw and tears were running down her cheeks. On the other end of the line, silence. She'd done it. She had satisfied and feeling strangely cleansed, she smiled to herself. The sore throat was worth it. Are you quite finished, madam? We need to open your computer now. <laughs> she hung up, but immediately the phone rang again. Mary lifted it. Oh, I think that's, that's, that's all I'm gonna read. That's for two pages. So if you want to find out what happens to poor Mary, mm. you have to buy the book. It's a sp suspense. <laughs> yes, and very poignant, really. Lovely. Yes, yeah. poor Mary. I, I did scream into the phone at my continual <laughs> call. Well. It did yeah. not work. Okay. So your computer still doesn't work then? <laughs> Actually, it did crash. It was probably him. <laughs> he was right. Yeah. Okay, um, we might move on to Andrea and then we'll come back, Edwina, towards the end to um, hear about your and uh, everyone's favourites in the collection. So, Andrea, I think you're there. You're still there, Andrea? I'm here, Steve. Good. Um, so, Andrea, you're a uh, God, what the list of things that you do is kind of a bit weird, really. Um, <laughs> Psychologist, writer, poet, memoirist, children's author, uh, born in the country, city based these days. Um, you've got a book in preparation, which was shortlisted for the Rochelle Prize in 2015. Um, and you were a contributor to this anthology, Our Inside Voices, and also to last year's Spanish flu anthology. Um, so, uh, tell us what the Rochelle Prize is. That was what I wanted to know, Andrea, when I saw that in your bio. Well, there was this lovely gentleman called Matt Rich. It's... Um, How do you pronounce it? Richel. Matt Richel. Richel. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he worked for Hachette Australia. And sadly, he died in a surfing accident in 2014. And he'd been a great champion of emerging writers. So in his memory, his wife and family uh, working together with Hachette and Guardian Australia uh, established the Rich Rochelle Ritual. It's Ritual, but it's so hard to remember that. Um, established the Ritual Prize in 2015. And I think I put a typo in my bio. So I was actually shortlisted in 2016, um, the year that Susie Greenhill won. Uh, it's, it's a fabulous prize. I would encourage all uh, emerging writers to enter it. I think it's great. Shortlisting was a fantastic experience. I learned a lot.
Okay, great. And was it for short stories or what was the prize? Um, mine was a short story, but yeah. I'm just having a quick look. It's, uh, it's open to unpublished writers of adult fiction and ar adult narrative nonfiction. Okay, good. And you don't good. have to have written a full book at the time that you enter, but you just have to have the intention to, to write okay. a, a whole book and it's judged on the first three chapters. Okay, write that down, everyone. Now, so Andrea, um, you're a pretty busy person by the sound of it. What, what, when COVID hit, what were you doing and what prompted you to put, put a story into writing? Matthew rang me. Uh, so I'm, I've got a piece in Majelki Blues and I've got a piece in All We Could Do. And, um, and Matthew contacted me to say, is this a good idea? Should we do an anthology of, of Queensland Voices talking about COVID? And I went, yes, that's a great idea. And Matthew said, oh, good, um, I'll do it then. And then I went, oh, sugar, now I actually have to write something. Um, and it was, it was quite strange, really, because I had lots of ideas going on. And, you know, we have water cooler conversations all the time about how COVID is affecting us. Uh, but what I found myself doing was writing a poem. And I haven't published a poem for 20 years, but that's, that's just what happened. It, it came out as a poem. And I think mm -hmm. I, I really needed the form, the structure to, mm -hmm. to be able, otherwise it's a big mush, isn't it? It's so overwhelming and we're talking about it all the time. We're bombarded by media mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just needed a, a really simple, very structured way to talk about the experience. So it came mm -hmm. out as a poem. Okay. And were you working from home during COVID? Yeah, I, I'm a vulnerable person because of my asthma. So I was working from home quite a bit. And to be able to socially distance at my work, half of us still have to work from home half of the week. So I love working from home. I get a lot more done. But I do like going into the office and connecting with people too. Yeah, we can have a long conversation about introverts and extroverts and, and yeah. how they felt about the COVID. Um, but we won't have that here. Um, I noticed when I read, I went back and read your um, story from the Spanish flu stories and then read your poem here. And so both of them combined your interest in environment, because you're pretty active in the environment area, and, um, and you're interested in medical stuff, although this was medical, that, that was not necessarily an obsession of yours. But I was just interested that you kind of uh, managed to find an environmental theme in both cases to work your stories around. Tell us a little bit about how um, that side of your life knits together with your writing side of your life. Mm. Well, my entire career has always been about arts, health and environment. So the, the um, interfaces amongst those. I work in health now. I've worked in health most of my life. Um, so... To me, they just go together. They go hand in hand. You, you can't have health without the environment. Um, you can't have health without the arts. And it's, it's just great to make art about the environment. I think it's good for our health. Okay, yep. And of, of course, we write best about what we know, don't we? Yeah, and about what we love, what we care about. Uh, one of my earliest poems, the earliest one I remember is from uh, when I was seven, that by that stage I could write. And my first poem was about the moon. So I've, I've obviously always been interested in the world around me. Yeah, yeah. And in this case, you've written it with a, a garden metaphor in, how many parts are in this poem? About 10 or 12, I think. You're asking a I question know, I, I can't I didn't, remember. No, and I don't know either. Um, but <laughs> let's read, let's have you read whatever you think is appropriate, but maybe from the beginning and, and then from the end of the um, poem. Sure. Um, lovely and, piece. And this, was, this is very much a true story. I realised recently that everyone in my family uses gardening to stay sane. I mean, we're from the country, so that's probably part of it. But I was creating this garden and that's when the poem started com coming together. So it's called COVID Garden. I am writing a garden to fill with neglected back deck pot plants, bits of succulents, fingernails snipped on walks, suckers springing in unplanned places. I have cleared a space. Everyone is doing this. Bunnings is where you'll catch it, they say. Or spotlight, 
everyone's there. Projects will save us from madness. So I get my hands dirty, grubbing up rocks of self-doubt, stubborn roots of old fears that cling and catch, dragging my heart's earth as I rip them out, rake level, and in a blind panic of creativity, racing despair, plant. The poem goes on to um, talk about emotions in terms of plants. So I'll just go to the one at the end, which is called peace. Deep rooted, rewards mindful tending. The weather, autumn here, spring otherwhere, is ironically beautiful. We can't go anywhere but inside ourselves. My garden fills with bees, birds, butterflies, roads and sky empty of traffic. I startle on the rare occasion a plane goes over. Hope, a hardy evergreen. On the other side, we'll feel nonplussed, dream woken. That happened. Here we are. I love that poem. Um, it's it's just um, so so familiar. I mean, I think a lot of us have got out into our backyards and into our gardens because we've had to go somewhere to get out of the house, and sometimes we haven't been allowed to go any further. Um, so that's that's great. Um, I was going to ask you and each of you, of the three of you, um, in this series of stories, fifty of them and poems, etc. What were there, were there stories that took you by surprise? Start with you, Andrea, since you're on screen. Um, stories that captured you more than others. I have to say, I'd have to reiterate what was said earlier about what an amazingly diverse collection this is and so beautifully balanced. I love the different age groups, different gender, different um, backgrounds, different experiences, different forms. Um, it's not individual stories that captured me, but moments when I say, okay, I had that experience. I felt that as well. But what that writer has done with it, their perceptions of it and their treatment of it as a writer is just something I would never have thought of. And it's, it's beautiful and amazing. So two of the moments that jump out at me are Amanda Niehaus's story, uh, which is, it's got a lot about the body and it's about a writer and this writer's body and basically writer's block. The writer intends to write, but can't. And it really resonated with me because at the beginning of the pandemic, I was speaking to a singer who said, I thought with all this extra time on my hands that I'd be singing and singing and writing songs and making music, and I don't feel like singing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've heard from so many artists and, uh, and writers and other people. It seems like the perfect time to make art, but in fact, to make art, you need to feel some degree of safety or certainty mm -hmm. or having your energy. And we are all spending our energy on surviving. Mm -hmm. And the other one that I really liked was Eve Stafford's story, which was um, sort of getting into talking about the false dichotomies, as if, as if we need to support health or the economy, as, as mm -hmm. if those two things aren't completely dependent. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I really loved her analysis of sort of an intellectual analysis of mm. some of the nonsense that we are told. <laughs> it has brought to light a lot of the nonsense, I reckon. Um, what about you, Matthew? Did you have um, stories that surprised you or um, touched you? It was the poetry that, that um, surprised me. And I'm going to mark myself as a Philistine. I don't tend to read poetry. I find a kind of spooky and uh, intimidating. But the poems were, were very impressive. And I, I'm glad that my role in the book forced me, exposed me to these poems. Mm -hmm. um, short ones in particular, Nick Earl, so as Edwina mentioned, uh, Mirad, uh, Talakta wrote a beautiful little poem um, and I think there's 18 or 19 poems in it and Andrea's is fantastically creative mm. but I, I was I was really delighted and um, pleased to have this kind of forced exposure to the poems. Mm. 
and uh, I think I have to revise my my attitude towards poetry and and indulge a bit more okay. because they're beautiful. It's a yeah. great poem. Yeah, good. Well, you might there might be a poet in you yet, Matthew. No, no, uh, not writing it, but reading yeah. it and enjoying it. Yeah. and they are consistently of a consistently good standard. There's nothing worse than really bad poetry, but um, the ones in this collection are are, are great. Beautiful. Well, uh, that nice. that was a that was a job in itself, and Nathan Shepherdson took that job on, and I'm just going to use this as another excuse to. Shout out to my editors. They they work very hard. It must have been very frustrating and uh, annoying to have to work so hard, but they did a fantastic job of distilling the work. And it wasn't always easy because some of the great stuff was rejected because it was kind of similar to other great stuff. Mm. So things weren't rejected only for poor quality. Mm. We, we had to say goodbye to some good quality stuff. And, yeah. and so that's tough work. Yeah. And they did a great job. Yeah, agree. So, Edwina, back to you. Um, my question was what surprised you or captured you? And you, you were particularly taken by Angela Hurley's piece, A Thicker Skin, um, under the COVID-19 Act. Would, can you just... Um, introduce us to that story and read, and I'm going to get you to read to us, but um, like your rationale, of, you know, what it says, and it's the last piece in the book, it's kind of, it's, um, it's very powerful. Yeah, I, for, for me, uh, Angelina puts everything in perspective. And that's why she ended up having the last say. I knew Angelina from Bioki Blues. <laughs> uh, and she's a wonderful, powerful Murray woman. And she did this piece. So she rang all of her auntie elders and talked to them about what their experience of COVID was. And, you know, us whiteies, we, we thought, oh, well, you know, they're probably terrified and hunkering down and because they're high risk. But no, what... <laughs> What we discovered was that people who have suffered an awful lot of trauma, this is just a blip. I mean, it's mm. nothing. Mm. <laughs> so mm. I'll read you a bit of A Thicker Skin under the COVID-19 Act by Angelina Hurley. Deal me a hand of COVID-19 hardship stories and I'll match and raise that with first-hand stories from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples about living under the Act. The Aboriginal's Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act was introduced in Queensland in 1897 and lasted until the early 1970s. However, restrictions on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples living on missions were maintained. Hardship, I can hear my elders say, I'll tell you about hardship. The policy established the isolation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples restricted their movements, limited access to and rationed the supply of food and resources, enforced unpaid slave labour upon them, removed people and cut off options for contact and communications, and seriously neglected their health and well-being. It allowed the government to maintain total control over all of their lives. Hence, being able to adapt to the rules and regulations is nothing out of the norm for us. My elders have sat back, as they always do, with the calm facial expression of observance that asks, what are they whinging about now? Isolation problems. Only two months into the strict homebound rules were people complaining about their boredom. The commentary via speakerphone between my elders has been both entertaining and informative, to say the least. It's nothing new. I've been isolated all my life from the time that I was born until the end of the act, Mum said. We were isolated from everywhere. We had to get permission to go anywhere, Auntie Elizabeth recalled. It was traumatic at times, being isolated, most importantly from family. We were close-knit and it really affected me when they sent me out to work, Auntie Iris says in a shaky voice. What? No toilet paper? We were stunned by the hysteria that occurred over the imaginary depletion of toilet paper worldwide. Rations were all that was issued to us, said Mum. 
you were given only a certain amount of food depending on the number of people in your family. If you had four kids, you got four cups of rice, one per kid. We never got any good meat, just the bones, bullock meat, no chicken. We only got fish if we went fishing ourselves on the mission. You just got the basic stuff. We used toilet, uh, newspaper as toilet paper and a handful of sawdust, said Auntie Elizabeth. Auntie Iris recalled being rationed scrap meat on a Tuesdays. We used to get leftovers, bones is what we got. We could only make soup and on other days, flour, tea, sugar, rice, and occasionally porridge. I remember so much soda and weevils in it that mum couldn't even make damper. What, more rules? The imposed restrictions on movement and gatherings that people found so hard to abide by came easy to our mob. I was uh, restricted on the Aboriginal Reserve. I was restricted everywhere I went. I was accountable to the government wherever I went. We were constantly told where to go and what to do. It didn't matter if you didn't like or didn't agree with it, you had to get permission to come and go from the mission. And if you weren't back by the designated time, you were jailed, recalled mum. Your hands were always tied, only allowed to do certain things, said Auntie Elizabeth. We had to get permits to go anywhere at all, out of the community, into town shopping, to any nearby townships, we had to report to the police station on return. Permission had to be gained to take your children to visit family. The sad reflection in Auntie Iris's voice seeps out of her mobile phone. So I think it's just wonderful that we've got the voices of these aunties, these wise women who have suffered so much in their lives, putting everything into perspective. You know, it's really not that hard to stay at home in a comfy house with plenty of food and plenty of toilet paper uh, and if not, there's always, you know, water, running mm. water. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. And I do acknowledge, of course, the suffering of people who have lost people through COVID. And it's not an attack. It's just an illustration of, yeah, there are different degrees of trauma. And if you've been through a whole lot of it, this is, you know, this is very small. And especially in yeah. Queensland, we've been very, very lucky. Yeah. A telling piece and uh, important to be reminded of that history as well. Um, Bianca, I think you're there somewhere. Um, we've got five or seven minutes left. I thought we might take some questions if there's any people out there who are wanting to engage with um, our panellists. Certainly, about... yes, of course, yeah. Steve. Um, I am definitely here and I'm just looking. We've had a question come through. Um, I'll just go back up in the chat here. Um, and yeah, in the meantime, wow, thank you so much. Um, I've really, I've so enjoyed this discussion so far. And I know our guests, um, our audience are um, not on video, but I can feel that everyone would just be collectively nodding their heads and, in, in, you know, just relating to your experiences and the stories as well. So if you haven't read the book, the anthology, um, please check it out. Um, so um, Murad, uh, has sent through a question um, and I believe he's also a contributor. Um, mm. Yeah, we've got a, um, I see a few familiar um, names as well. Um, so that's wonderful. We'll definitely shout out to those contributing authors um, as well. So um, now Murad has asked, what do you feel it is about stories and poems uh, and the writing of them that helps us navigate difficult or strange times? And this wasn't asked to anyone in particular. So, um, panel, <laughs> feel You'd like free. to pick it up. <laughs> oh, I'll take it. <laughs> That's one for me. Uh, I, I do a lot of work uh, with people who have suffered trauma using creativity to um, address that trauma. And I think that that's why we are given the creative impulse is to actually process our emotions and poetry, writing, painting, Cooking, that's why I mean, cooking is creative. That's why everybody was cooking. Uh, well, however you can, it not only takes you into another place, uh, you know, you get lost in the zone, uh, but it's also a way to process and create meaning from what you're experiencing. Yeah. And I'll yeah, chime in on that too, because I'm a psychologist and uh, Bessel van der Kolk at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, he's a worldwide 
expert, very well recognized in trauma. And he talked about the seven preconditions for trauma. And a couple of them have to do with identity, purpose, and sense of meaning. And um, I think that uh, buys straight into what Edwina is saying. We, we needed to assert ourselves, to assert our identity, to assert a sense of purpose, to create something solid that we could hold on to, whether it was a garden or a meal or a cushion. Um, that's what the projects were about. But for a lot of people, writing and telling the story and structuring the experience and the words was kind of how we wrote our way through it. Yeah, I, I might definitely add a bit, to that. I might just add a bit of historical context to that and say that it's, um, as Edwina said, it's about meaning. As uh, Andrea said, it's about identity and so on. We need to uh, capture the feelings, not just the statistics. We need to tell the stories and we need to put them into a durable and an enduring form so that other people can learn um, what we were thinking, what we were feeling, what we were, what we were going through. Yeah, so bearing that, witness, that's a yeah. primary yeah. impulse. Yeah. Good. Well, I think through the, my own writing this year, I've certainly learned uh, there's a big difference between uh, loneliness and solitude. Um, and that has been through escapism and writing about lighthouses. So <laughs> um, we've got a few comments that I'll read out. Um, I'll just check once more if we've got any questions that have come through. Laura's uh, so, asked one. Sorry? Laura Elvery has asked one, which I oh, think is great. You. Okay. Asking if, if we think our pieces would be different if we started now. Mm. And I have to say, yes, definitely, because reading the anthology, reminds me of how I felt at the beginning. And it's only been a few months, but strange experiences mess with your sense of time. So quite often I was reading along and went, oh yeah, that's right. Oh, that happened. Oh yeah, we were feeling that then. And yeah, it's been such a short time, but, but we've been on such a journey. I think we feel different things now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to um, answer that one as well? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, writing in the midst of the uh, turmoil was at some level cathartic, at some level reaching out to connect with others to, to see if other people were sharing your experience. Uh, but six months down the track, it's kind of, well, in Queensland, we've been very lucky, you know. So my level of panic <laughs> has come down to a much more manageable level. So... Um, I think if I wrote again, it would be, uh, I don't know, it would have less urgency. Um, it would still be the same story, but I wouldn't feel it as strongly, I don't think, as I did six months ago. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm. We have been very fortunate in Queensland. Mm. We, we have. Uh, touch wood, Matthew. <laughs> it, it's not over, but it's... Uh... Still out there. We, we can already say we've been lucky so far. Yeah. And, and I can uh, recommend reading Matthew's uh, City in Masks as well. And then it will also help put things in perspective and give people an idea of, you know, this has happened before in history. Don't panic. <laughs> uh, it, it, it has its own lifespan. I mean, Matthew knows more about that. But just, just reading that historical perspective does help. Um, yeah. Thanks, Edwin. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lovely comment from Linda Bruce Smith. Um, and I said uh, to Linda, thank you for your piece, The Rise of the Introvert. Um, I, yeah, that one stood out to me as well. Um, she says, how lovely. This whole exercise was such a delight. And Matthew goes about what he does with such grace. Um, so thank you so much for that, Linda. And, um, and uh, yeah, loving the discussion. And uh, I just think it's creative resilience at work. <laughs> and to look here. We're such meaning making creatures, um, Murad says. Thanks for the responses to the panel. And uh, Benny, Benny Banana says, I really feel we did the right thing to have it all written at the time the crisis first hit. It will make a great historical document years on. Yes. Um, 
yeah, so just reading out those comments as well for um, for um, those who will be watching the recording later on um, as well. So I know our panel can can see them. Um, and thank you again, Andrea, for for your eagle eyes on um, uh, Laura. Thank you so much for your question too. Um, so I don't think we'll have. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think you're about to say what I'm about to say. <laughs> I actually had one sneaky quick question, if I could okay. ask. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me um, who chose the cover design, the photograph? I'm very interested in, in your choice for, for the cover. Oh, again, that was another. <laughs> it's hard to make a decision when there are like five yeah. of you. <laughs> Six yeah. of us, I think, were making that decision in the end. Seven, because Michael was involved as well. And, uh, so I was, yeah, looking and at we it. We all for... had our favourites. We had our votes. And then I think Matthew and um, Ben won in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we so had to be dictatorial. Yeah. It's a did one of you take the photograph? No, it's a photograph from Bundaberg. By, uh, of a park in Bundaberg. Um, and it's by Brad Marsalis. And he's an ABC radio journalist up there. And he did a series of photographs for the ABC of um, quiet and the, and the solitude of the um, early lockdown period. Yeah. And I thought it was such a striking photograph. We did have yes. a, a competing image oh, and there was a lot of toing and froing. They both would have been good covers. But uh, one was, they were very, very different. And I'm, I'm happy with the choice. I think it's a very distinctive image. It is. It's intriguing as well. I looked mm. at it uh, for a long time before kind of figuring out what it was because I'm not near children's playgrounds very often. <laughs> I, walk past that, I walk past those playgrounds. My piece is about my um, relationship with my grandson who was two, two years old at that stage and um, taking him for walks down the park you know, every time he was at my place, which was once a week, <laughs> and he would look longingly at these uh, playgrounds that were all covered in plastic netting and, you know, socks yeah. and keep off. And, um, well, to a two-year-old, it was very hard to explain why that was out of bounds. Uh, uh, and Benny has just added that the competing image actually made it into the anthology, and I think I oh, remember... Oh, find it, find it. It's a beautiful that. Yeah, so if anyone can see that there. Yeah. Great image by Michael Cook. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing photographer. photographer. Excellent. Um, well, I was just wondering if anyone has any sort of final comments or just general statements. We'll be going to, because um, we're at 6.30 now, but, um, yeah, were we going to end it with the Q&A? I think so. Uh, um, that seems a, a nice round rounding off of the, um, of the session. Um, just, I know the book's available at Avid Reader. Now, are we allowed to mention other uh, outlets, Bianca? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah Matthew, where I'll else is it available? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all good Brisbane bookshops have it. <laughs> okay. and a few outside, but all the, all the good independent bookshops in Brisbane have got their copies. And, um, and would you say it would make a wonderful Christmas present, to Matthew? Yeah, yeah, I think you could, could make a good Christmas present. It's a creative anthology. It's not a morbid thing. It's uh, there's a it's a great collection of creative writing. Yeah, a, a wonderful book to have in your bag at the beach. I mean, we're trying to sell books here, but. <laughs> <laughs> And also, thinking. I think the yeah. piece is just being, you know, shorter and a lot more concise as well. It does make it for um, quite a fast-paced read. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So, Bianca, I'd like to thank you for hosting us on behalf thank of Apple. You. you did thank a great you. job. Thank, thank you, you, Matthew and uh, Edwina and Andrea. Thank, thank you. So hopefully, well. hopefully, our audience enjoyed the conversation and um, got a bit of an insight into the book, and they should. Go out and buy a copy or a second copy if they've already got a copy. Yeah, yeah. I yes, sent through the thanks to the audience well. for being here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Everybody. Yeah.
hopefully we'll be uh, back to Avid where we'll do, be doing these hybrid sort of events where we're doing some in person as well as live streaming and enabling everyone um, to be able to attend from no matter where they are. So um, what I'm going to do now is uh, let our audience uh, this is the interactive component um, where I'll allow everyone to um, unmute themselves and um, join us in a round of applause for our special guests um, oh. this evening. I will just, there we go. Everyone should now be able to unmute themselves um, and we'll go out with a big round of applause. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure to be here and uh, to meet you all. So. Good. See you again. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Gal. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. 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 See you, Edwina. Bye. Nice to yeah, meet soon. you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Bye. Bye, Benny Banana. <laughs> <laughs>